so let me do a quick introduction uh, uh, to myself and uh, the rest of the folks who are here joining today uh, for the webcast. So I'm Gina King. I am responsible for our software ecosystem and our strategic alliances. So software ecosystem, including our ISVs. Um, and again, thanks for joining us today. So uh, we also have Steve Sibley, who is here with, uh, he's our Vice President of Offering Management, um, Petra Burr, who is our AIX Offering Manager, and Allison Butterall, who is our IBMI Offering Manager. So what we are planning to share with you today, uh, and this is the first of many webcasts, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a moment here, but um, we are very excited about uh, you know, re-energizing re our communication with our, our ISV community. So this is you know, first of a, a series of different programs that we'll offer, and um, we'll talk about some of the resources that are available for you today. Uh, we realize we haven't been in communication maybe for a while um, directly with you, although you know, we've, been, we've been busy doing a lot of, of innovation on our end. So that's part of what we want to share with you. So Steve will take you through uh, some of the market dynamics we're seeing. Um, likely you're probably seeing some, some similar ones. We'll talk through the strategic investments that we're making within cognitive systems and uh, how you as an ISC can leverage those. And then the other thing we'll cover today is um, what we've been doing with AIX and IBMI. So a lot around modernization, as you're probably also hearing from clients, things they're interested in like cloud and AI. And then we'll wrap it up to let you know what kind of resources are available to you today um, and how you can make, take some next steps in our partnership. So let me just jump into this re-engagement um, <laughs> discussion here. And uh, so we, we have been hearing from our clients. I, I hope that many of you have been hearing from your clients as well. Uh, they're very eager for us to continue working together to strengthen our partnerships. Many of them have, you know, they're on journeys to cloud. Um, they're starting to implement AI, which gives them some real uh, differentiation and competitive advantage. And those are just a couple of examples of where we are hearing from clients that you know, we should be working together. I think we have a lot of opportunity to, to deliver um, you know, joint solutions that help solve the, the major challenges that clients are having in their business today. So this is very much driven by our, our clients. We, have, we work very closely with many ISCs today, where, um, and Steve will talk a bit more about that. But we're very eager to, to broaden that community and, and you know, strengthen our, our partnerships uh, with many more in the ISC uh, community as well. So as I mentioned before, this is just the beginning of, of a series of communication and you know, programs that we're putting in place for our ISVs. So this is the first of a series of webcasts. You'll hear from us on a quarterly basis. And, and you will see that we have some polls uh, as part of this webcast to try to understand a bit more about you know, where you are in your, your business um, you know, with clients, what are some of your key initiatives, um, which are, are likely driven by the clients, uh, as well as you know, areas that we've been investing in our, in our business. So we, we intend to make this the ongoing communication quarterly. Um, we'll find out what's important to you and that's what will drive the content for future webcasts. We're also planning on regular newsletters out to our ISV community as well as, and you'll, you'll see an opportunity um, toward the end of the webcast uh, to engage in one-on-one -on -one discussions with us um, by request. We're, we're excited to be working with you. We have a lot of programs in place that can can help your business, help you, you know, with the client's journey and continue to deliver uh, value on power systems. So we'll talk about some of the support that's available as well. So let me, um, let me uh, actually we have a poll here <laughs> to start with. Um, you'll notice this on your screen. Um, if you could just take a couple of minutes we would like to know what's most important to your business at this time. And again, I'm, I'm sure a lot of this is client driven, um, but we would like to understand some of the focus areas for you. So we'll, we'll take a few minutes to just complete the poll. Okay, 
Great. All right. So as I mentioned, we'll we'll go into the market dynamics and the strategic investments that we think are of value to to our ISV community, you know, based on what we've heard from our ISVs and what we've heard from our clients as well. So Steve, let me turn it over to you. Um, and give me one second here. Right there, you go. Thanks, Gina, and thanks everyone for for joining us uh, today and spending your uh, important time. We we know and recognize that your time is the most valuable thing you can offer us. So so you taking the time to kind of hear our updates and and directions, uh, we certainly appreciate. You know, it's a, a fascinating fascinating time to you know be part of IT. You know, over the last decade or so, uh, information technology and what we're driving from a capability standpoint has become the central focal of almost every organization and business, right? It, uh, you know, about four years ago, we had done a poll of CEOs and, and technology was the number one aspect of what they were focused on, on how to improve and, and drive their business in different ways. And we've just continued to see that grow uh, as we look at how businesses are delivering value to their customers and uh, expanding what they're doing, whether it's you know incorporating mobile technology, whether it's leveraging the cloud, or whether it's beginning to incorporate things like machine learning and deep learning in, into uh, your applications that you're providing your customers and, and customer environments. And you know, as we look at where we are today, right? It, we really are seeing you know kind of the next phase of that occur. Right, much of that innovation and work has been done in that mobile space, driving applications that are out to users, and being able to engage them in new ways, opening up new channels and, and new services. But now as we talk to businesses from an IBM standpoint in our CIO studies and our engagements with clients, we're seeing kind of a, a next chapter emerge around this transformation and, and digital um, push that's occurring. Right, we're moving from that consumer-driven, user-driven kind of focus to how do I transform my core business and my core enterprises uh, in ways to take advantage of some of this technology. Right? Digital and AI is moving kind of from the experimentation stage into how do I leverage it for my core business applications. And we have more and more customers now coming to us asking, you know, I'm ready to transform my mission-critical core business application but I still need to be able to leverage a cloud-like environment for that, right? And, and you know, as the provider or the platform uh, with power systems uh, being kind of core to that environment uh, in many of our customers, we're seeing, you know, that interest just accelerate uh, more and more um, uh, in, in our feedback. And that's why we are, you know, really driving a hybrid cloud direction and, and strategy uh, as we go forward. And as I talk about our strategy where we're seeing opportunities, you'll see that very much uh, come through uh, from an environment standpoint. And as we see these customers come to us and have that question, one of the things that is really clear is that the infrastructure still matters. Right, you know, a few years ago, people were talking about the fact that, oh, you know, I'll move to the cloud, everything will be seamless there, you know, infrastructure is, you know, more of a commodity, who cares what server it's running on. What we're really seeing, though, as these two dynamics around both mission-critical enterprise applications moving to the cloud and this whole emergence of cognitive or machine learning, deep learning applications, that the infrastructure that you put technology on can still differentiate your business and, and deliver value uh, for, for clients. And, and that's why we've seen, you know, really a resurgence in focus, at least from an IBM standpoint and our power system standpoint, in clients trying to understand how they leverage power in their hybrid cloud, multi-cloud uh, strategy going forward. And so if you look at our strategy, right, and it has really evolved tremendously over the last five years if you haven't been keeping up with, with who Power Systems is. You know, number one is we've changed kind of our division focus to be a cognitive systems brand, uh, brand or, or division, uh, still leveraging our Power Systems architecture and direction, but expanding in new ways that I'll talk about in, in just a few minutes. But we're still focused on being that trusted, secure, core platform for our, for our key customers. One of the things we you know, pride ourselves on as IBM is how we help customers evolve and transition the investments they've had into new spaces, new capabilities, and new directions. Right? And so, you know, that's why we continue to deliver new uh, capabilities on AIX and IBMI 
even why we are developing and delivering, you know, leadership um, differentiated capabilities in the Linux space uh, as well. In fact, you know, over the last two years, we've seen seven of eight quarters of growth across our business as clients continue to invest in AIX and I as their core business operating systems and environments while they begin to bring in new applications or new capabilities in the enterprise Linux and cognitive infrastructure space. We build our strategy around really three key tenets or capabilities. One is being that trusted and secure architecture, right? It's, it's no secret that, you know, companies have come to power in IBM because they can count on our systems being up, being flexible, being resilient, and delivering the best overall performance and capability uh, for their environments. That's why we had so many customers join uh, with us and encouraging SAP to finally enable uh, SAP HANA's application on mm -hmm. Power. And we're now, you know, approaching, uh, you know, 25 or so percent share of that marketplace. We have over 2,500 clients that have adopted SAP HANA on Power. And one of the really interesting things is 20 to 25 percent of those clients actually have never been on Power before. They're new clients to IBM and to IBM Power technology, but they see that value of resiliency and flexibility as well as a better TCO running enterprise class Linux applications on Power than on Intel-based platforms in those environments. And then, the, you know, the focus on cognitive infrastructure overall, right? This emergence of machine learning, deep learning, or AI kind of um, uh, frameworks uh, to be able to enhance customers' businesses is the fastest growing workload in the industry, as you'll see, uh, and I'll talk about a little bit later. You know, we've leveraged our capabilities there to deliver the number one and number two supercomputers in the world running on power systems by adopting a focus around acceleration as a key part of an architecture going forward. And I think you'll see as, you know, more companies look at how they exploit machine learning and deep learning frameworks, their, their interest in being able to take advantage of these high bandwidth accelerators that we deliver on power systems is just a growing part of what will be a future architecture for IT and technology. So driving that trusted, secure capabilities, ensuring that we're delivering open innovation um, and, and leveraging the open innovation in the industry overall, and then finally, ensuring that you have the agility or our customers have the agility to, to run their capacity where they want and how they want uh, within their infrastructure. So, you know, I'm going to take a, just a couple moments just to re-highlight the fact, though, that one of the things that we have really done over the last few years is expand our overall roadmap, right? Not that we, you know, as we invest in Linux, you know, uh, you know, those additional investments have brought new capabilities to the platform in addition to the fact that we continue, as you'll hear throughout this presentation, to enhance our AIX and IBMI and Linux on Power stack from a Power VM, a Power Virtual um, Center perspective with Power VC Cloud Manager, and, and other capabilities. But we've got this new focus around acceleration where we are bringing new systems architectures uh, to, to the industry overall and a new investment from Cognitive Systems specifically in a AI software stack, something we call machine, Watson Machine Learning Accelerator and Power AI Vision, uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about uh, throughout this presentation to help clients accelerate their capabilities in machine learning and deep learning uh, within their enterprises. You know, Power Systems continues to be a leading architecture uh, from an overall capability standpoint. We still have the best performance uh, from a processor core standpoint. You know, we continue to focus our design points around data, the ability to move data, the ability to process data, you know, faster than any other architecture in the industry. Our memory capacity and our memory bandwidth uh, continues to be leadership with nearly 2x the bandwidth and, you know, up to two to four times the capacity of memory, which is, you know, insatiable in today's environment. And, you know, the, you know, the first platform with PCIe Gen 4, and in fact, you know, Intel still has not delivered a PCIe Gen 4 platform uh, within their architecture uh, from a, an I.O. bandwidth standpoint. And then the last piece of this is just the, this new focus around acceleration and driving a coherent link to leverage some of these GPU acceleration capabilities that are inherent in machine learning, deep learning requirements uh, going forward. 
So we've made our systems both, you know, leadership technology-wise, ready for the cloud and ready for these new AI workloads, but we don't compromise or step away from the fact that being secure, resilient, and flexible are critical for mission-critical workloads uh, in our customers. You know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the best examples of this has been, you know, our growth over the last four years with SAP HANA. Right? As I mentioned, we have 2,500 clients in less than, you know, four years. You know, we continue to be ranked number one from a resiliency perspective. And one of the other things we're seeing is just a real growth in hosting, cloud-hosted um, system uh, uh, providers, managed service providers, leveraging power to actually host SAP HANA, right, for their clients. Because of the resiliency, because of the cloud-like capabilities with virtualization capabilities that we can deliver and that SAP has certified, it's really a great opportunity for those CSPs to get better efficiencies as well as better uh, service levels for their clients. You know, it's why we won the Pinnacle Award with SAP as the Infrastructure Partner of the Year. It's why, you know, studies from Forrester and others point out that moving SAP HANA to power gives you 137% return on your investments and less than seven months of payback. And it's why our clients, you know, get to production, get to full usage of these new applications faster on power than anywhere else uh, within the environment. You know, one of the other key uh, commitments, though, uh, that you may not be aware of unless you've been keeping up, is the fact that open innovation has become a central part of who Power Systems is. In fact, five years ago, we announced the Open Power Foundation with Google, Mellanox, NVIDIA, Tyan, and obviously IBM as an open foundation, right? Not an IBM-led foundation, but an open foundation to add value to uh, the power architecture. There's over 300 members now uh, as part of the Open Power Foundation that are contributing technologies and leveraging the capabilities of power technologies in brand new ways. Without that openness, we would not have been able to deliver the number one and two supercomputers in the world, along with NVIDIA and Mellanox. We would not be able to deliver five times the performance uh, on an accelerated computing system for machine learning and deep learning uh, applications that we're seeing in our customers. right? Opening up the architecture and building this ecosystem and partnerships has been key to, to the success we've seen over the last two years. In addition, our full adoption of Linux, moving to Little Indian Linux from a, an architecture standpoint for ease of portability and optimization, expanding our focus on key workloads and key partners in, in the Linux space uh, as well has been a key piece of that, along with open management. Right? Our ability to now plug in and, and leverage cloud-like technologies and orchestrations that, that our customers are using uh, to automate their environments right, is built on our movement to OpenStack as a foundation for Power's cloud management and then upwardly integrating into other platforms from VMware or you know, with OpenShift and Red Hat uh, as well. So our commitment is, is foundational to openness in everything we do now within Power Systems, and from the open source tools and languages that we put on AIX and I to everything else that we're doing uh, as a platform. But let me move quickly to you know the, the next overall focus that we have, right? And I'll spend the remaining you know next ten minutes or so around what we're doing around cloud and hybrid cloud and then AI. You know, cloud really has reset IT expectations. Our clients are expecting self-service capability. They expect to pay as you go, even if they're leveraging our technology on premises or in the cloud. They want access to resources immediately to make their developers more productive than ever or to be able to bring up your applications as ISVs and get them into their development, QA, and production environments faster than they ever have before. They want to be able to scale you know, rapidly on demand and simplify their operations, right, within, within their environment. But all of that, as we see it, and as you look at what you're seeing from almost every analyst in the industry, whether it's Gartner, IDC, IDC Forrester, or the other um, uh, uh, more boutique kind of analysts, is that cloud is really, you know, a multi-cloud world. In fact, you know, the vast majority of customers, right, 91% are in five or more clouds today leveraging either software as a service, infrastructure as a service, or building their own on-premises private cloud. And so cloud is really a capability 
not just a place uh, in our clients' minds today. And that's why as we look at cloud, we've been committed to this view of you should be able to manage and drive your infrastructure and power systems where you want and how you want within your environment, whether that's transforming your on-premises infrastructure for cloud, whether it's leveraging IBM's cloud or, or many other partner clouds, which we, you know, if you've been keeping up in the press, you know, Power is in Google's cloud. It's you know, uh, Azure and SkyTap announced that they'll bring power systems to, to their cloud. And we have, you know, dozens of companies that have are hosting, you know, specialized cloud for managed services or specific software as a service applications on power systems as well. And you need to be able to manage it how you want as well. Clearly, IBM will try to differentiate ourselves with our IBM Cloud Packs and our Cloud Pack for, for multi-cloud management. But open technologies like Red Hat's OpenShift and VMware's VRealize um, uh, suite uh, of, of capability can also manage your power systems uh, environment as well. And so our customers can manage power systems and those applications running on power just like they manage any other system within their infrastructure uh, from, from Intel, uh, whether it's running uh, Linux or, or even Windows in, in many cases. So that flexibility to, to manage your infrastructure where you want and how you want is one of those other key reasons customers are continuing to look at how they evolve with us within power systems. And we really think this hybrid multi-cloud world is a journey, right? We're seeing our customers transform their on-premises environments to cloud-like uh, uh, power infrastructure as a service. We now, uh, as of this year, right, have announced power systems and AIX and IBMI in the IBM Cloud. And as I mentioned, we're also in Google, many of our other partners. And SAP recently announced that power systems is in SAP's enterprise cloud environment, and they will be leveraging power for nearly all of their workloads over two terabytes. Uh, for for that uh, cloud-like infrastructure. We're delivering, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Red Hat acquisition and what we're doing with Red Hat around OpenShift and IBM Cloud Packs, but clearly helping you modernize your applications if you want to take advantage of containers or, or microservices right alongside your AIX and I uh, uh, applications that may continue to run in VMs uh, within your environment. And then finally, managing that full environment in a true multi-cloud world where we can show you, uh, clients that they can manage both their VMs and their other environments uh, as well um, within their capabilities. I'll talk more in the next chart around this whole direction around multi-cloud management and where we're headed. If you followed the acquisition of, IB, of Red Hat uh, by IBM, you know, it really was a focus of seeing where applications are going and the emergence of Kubernetes and OpenShift as the foundational uh, capability and technology uh, for many new applications going forward, right? It's, you know, we have committed to move IBM's middleware technology as a whole into these things called cloud packs running on top of OpenShift. And Red Hat and OpenShift will continue to be that open hybrid multi-cloud platform leveraged by you know, the vast majority of clouds in the industry and, and you know, most Fortune 500 companies and a growing open ecosystems of capabilities. Right? OpenShift will be open. We'll continue to enhance and deliver value from an IBM standpoint on top of that. And from a power system standpoint, we'll be able to leverage all of that investment and capability both by Red Hat and IBM to run and manage these applications. You know, Cloud Packs is going to be one of those very interesting capabilities and, and technologies where not only is IBM going to enable our own applications with the, you know, you know Cloud Pack requirements around resiliency and and uh, you know uh, lifecycle maintenance and and scalability and and all of the things that people are looking for for enterprise class applications, even in an open uh, container or microservices environment. We'll also be working with ISVs like yourselves to build out your own cloud packs. We already have certain ISVs that are committing to build their own cloud packs on top of OpenShift from a deployment perspective as well. And I encourage you to think about that uh, as you go forward. But let me bridge real quickly then <clears throat> to the other key capabilities that we're seeing emerging from the industry. AI really is uh, taking the imagination of many customers, but it's also starting to grow from a production capability as well. 
you know, every single industry is going to be impacted by AI. And in fact, if you look at the progression in these markets, it's really beginning to accelerate from proof of concepts into production uh, environments and, and really new use cases. Right? And you know, I've highlighted a few of the industries and, and some of the areas that Gartner sees, you know, progression. Uh, you know, but Gartner even said that you know, AI by next year will be a top five priority from an overall business standpoint in 50% of top businesses uh, around the world. So it clearly is becoming something that not only has got the imagination of developers and, and the media and the press, it's got the attention of the core business leaders um, that you know, Gartners and others talk to uh, in every industry and every business. But getting to that game-changing improvement from maybe AI actually takes some changing in the thought process around the infrastructure. Right? One of the key things when you start thinking about truly augmented reality or AI kind of technologies is the explosion in the amount of data. And so this ability to move data much more quickly, the ability to feed these accelerators that uh, we talk about, so with GPUs from NVIDIA or AMD or others, with the amount of data to process, takes a different approach from an architecture standpoint, an approach that we've taken. Right? It's a reason that the AC922, our accelerated computing system that is the building block for those two biggest supercomputers in the world, delivers incredible results for customers because of the faster iterations by being able to feed the data quickly in a coherent way to that acceleration platform. And the openness that we built around this ecosystem with you know, third parties like NVIDIA or other technology or all the open source frameworks like TensorFlow and CAFE and, and Torch and PyTorch and, and the other capabilities enables customers to take advantage of this and quickly begin to deploy machine learning, deep learning projects that they can turn into business value. But we enable us you know, not only to take that building block on a small scale, but we've proven, right, obviously with our capabilities and, and, and serviceability capability, that you can expand that into clusters as big as any, any client may need, and that's how we built the, the two biggest supercomputers in the world. But not only is the infrastructure a key part of what our focus is from a power system standpoint, we've built a whole new focus around AI software and middleware capabilities to enable customers to take advantage of these machine learning and deep learning frameworks in new ways. We have our Watson ML Community Edition, Watson Machine Learning Accelerator, that takes some of the key capabilities like distributed deep learning, like large model support, uh, leveraging things like our spectrum conductor uh, for Spark technologies that enable you to run your machine learning, deep learning applications faster to get better results because of the distributed aspect of, of what we deliver from a value standpoint for, for our customers. And I encourage you as an ISV to start thinking about how you might think of these technologies and capabilities to augment your own applications as well. The other two products on the top of this chart, Power AI Vision and a partnership with a, an ISV called H2O, are also seeing tremendous uh, uh, uptick in the, in the marketplace because of the differentiated value both their applications provide as well as the platform running on it from an IBM standpoint and, and a power systems perspective. In fact, if you look at you know, the growth that we're seeing in AI vision kind of capabilities in new markets, whether it's distribution or manufacturing or you know, even communications for quality control of, of cell phone lines or um, uh, transportation uh, kind of environments, you know, every industry has some sort of visual recognition or image recognition and analysis kind of workload that can take advantage of an AI vision type of product. And the award-winning Power AI Vision for its usability and ease of use uh, capabilities gives uh, our clients capabilities that they haven't had before, and it may give you opportunities to augment your application as well. You know, SaaS has, has recognized the value of the throughput we get uh, from a power systems, both in our GPU accelerated systems and just the overall bandwidth we have with our PCIe Gen 4 and, and memory bandwidth to accelerate their applications. In fact, they just announced this quarter that they've moved their SaaS via a suite of, of workloads to power. And you can listen to Ken Gahagan, right, their director of R&D on, on YouTube, talk about the advantages of power 
versus any other platform that they've enabled on uh, for their technology. And then, as I mentioned, H2O as the key partner, right, the kind of results customers like Banco Vision and Paraguay see by running H2O on IEC 922s that move their ability to build applications and models from, you know, between two and seven days to two hours. And when you think of what that can do to improve the results of their credit scoring, their ability to build new uh, financial products for their customers, it's made a, a tremendous change in their business. In fact, they've seen twice the amount of client propensity to purchase since they've moved to H2O on Power from H2O on Intel and an improvement of 50% in cross-selling revenue uh, in their systems. And so you as an ISB could think about how do you leverage machine learning technologies like H2O to augment your application and value you deliver to your customers as well. So that's just a quick run through of our direction, our strategy, the success that we're seeing in the market. And I hope it stimulates some thought that you have of how you can augment your applications with power systems to deliver new values to clients. But I want to come back and then you know, introduce uh, Petra and Allison to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing with our core operating systems, uh, AIX and IBM I. I continues to be the most integrated platform and value in the industry, but the openness that Allison and the team have driven to incorporate new languages and new capabilities is giving customers great opportunities to continue to enhance their, their uh, portfolios. And AIX continues to be the most highest performance, most resilient and open uh, Unix-based platform in the industry. And we've built a whole set of software around those solutions. In fact, a number of new capabilities around HA and, and security and compliance to help our clients take advantage of these technologies. But with that, let me actually turn it over to Petra Bure, right, our uh, um, uh, offering leader around AIX, to take you through more about what we're doing around AIX and, and our directions uh, with our system software. Thank you very much, Steve. So we're transitioning to, to more details around AX and IBM I, so Allison and I are doing that jointly. And what I did here is basically, this is my strategic theme one page of AX, and what we'll see is Allison will have a very similar one on the IBM I side of things. So AX always was and is a high-value platform to run mission-critical workloads uh, on with outstanding capabilities around performance scale, availability, and security, as Steve mentioned, and we are continuously further strengthening these. But for a while now, we are exploiting as well open technologies with our open source toolbox that is frequently enhanced with, with new and updated packages. We are contributing to various cloud automation communities such as Ansible, and due to the fact that Power VC is built on OpenStack managing AX environments, it's interoperable with high-level cloud orchestrators such as uh, VMware Realize, SAP, and, and, and others. And to that point in talking about cloud, we provide more and more cloud options, or some people talk about more flexible infrastructure choices as well, spanning both on and off-prem. And with Power VC and capability that one provides, we have nice features to actually move um, and share VMs across these hybrid um, environments. In addition, we have, and Steve touched on that, and I'll touch on that later in a bit in more detail, uh, the capability to integrate with these new cloud-native apps running in, in containers as well. Last but not least is, is AI. Um, and we have the capability to connect to the Watson data platform for a while. But what we heard from clients is, well, we do not really move our data to the cloud. At least some clients won't, uh, do not want to do that. So we are doing quite a bit to enable our AX and IBMI clients to leverage um, AI capabilities uh, for these environments as well. One question I get a lot is, when is the next AX major release coming out, or why didn't we put it out yet? So just a couple of sentences on that. I mean, we always, uh, or all the time, have a long-term roadmap in terms of, of AX, but our strategy was to deliver new features and functions in forms of technology levels. And you as ISDC are very well aware, right, the least um, disruptive for our, our clients is if we can uh, make uh, new features available in forms of technology levels, so we don't need to recompile. You as our ISVs don't need to recertify. But what we have seen that 
clients are really getting concerned that we didn't put out a next release yet. Um, so even though you talk to, to the clients that run AX, they say it's great, you do it um, non-disruptively, but if there won't be a next release at some point in time, I won't have my, my job anymore at some point in time. So that's why we were uh, having a, a plan for AX next release, uh, which will most likely be X73. We did not yet land on the time when we will make this happen, uh, but I just want to share that information uh, with you. Another question I get quite a bit is on which release stream is still in support, which release stream is supported on which hardware. So this chart captures the AX support metrics and which AX release stream is supported on what power generation. And at the moment, we see, I think, a positive trend and more and more clients running and moving to AX7.2, which is key because that's the, uh, the release stream where we put new features and functions in um, and exploit new hardware features. And if you ask me, it's not only important uh, to, to be current from a price performance uh, standpoint, but as well from, from a security standpoint. And of course, that, that's a key one um, as well in our chain relationship with, with US and ISV to make sure um, your application is certified on, on, on the latest, greatest um, stack, so to, so to speak. So on this slide, I do not want to go into the details, but I wanted to show that there's a lot going on in the X space continuously. And this chart just summarizes a variety of things we announced and will make available this quarter. Um, so related to the uh, base operating system, such as further Power9 exploitation to allow for new levels of workload scalability, strengthening our security and high availability capabilities. Life update is a really good example, which was enhanced quite a bit in recent TLs. And recently, um, we, we certified that with Oracle, which is the key one for our clients. And of course, we always would like to see more of those um, certifications uh, jointly with our ISVs. And then there's cloud, which we'll talk a little bit later in this presentation in more detail. In addition, uh, of course, there's a power system software stack adding um, uh, on top of AAX. And the way I look at it is that the power system software stack is the first level of ecosystem when it comes to AAX in front of IBM software and then, of course, your ISV applications. So Allison ha will have quite a few uh, clients' uh, stories later in this deck around application modernization. I just wanted to highlight a couple of AX modernization examples as well. So Niagara, who architected and created their next-gen trading platform, Coppel relying on our outstanding RAS capabilities and making sure their growth needs are and will be satisfied to, to keep the lights on in Brazil, or CenturyLink, who did integrate traditional AX with new workloads such as Subhana. And I think what this shows is that in many, many cases, I would say even in all of them, the answer is not the one or the other, but one and the other. Because there are good reasons to run specific workloads on AX, while others might be better suited to run on Linux alongside. So with that, let me hand over to Allison um, before we talk a little bit more about uh, the modernization piece. Wonderful. Thanks, Petra. So our IBMI strategy, as Petra said, we tried both of us to create a, summari a summary of our strategy. This is a strategy chart we've been using for quite some time for IBMI. Um, our strategy is really focused on three different pieces. The top piece is around solutions. Um, for those of you who are on the call who remember when we first introduced IBMI, it was called AS400. AS stood for application system. We know that this is a really strong area for IBM I, um, and many of you have um, grown your applications along with our technology. But we have major things that we do here. For example, we will exploit the latest power technology. We also have tweaked to this strategy document to include integration with some of the most advanced technologies that have been coming out. And so our strategy includes working with mobile interfaces, new types of user um, um, interface or experience, as well as integrating um, work with Internet of Things, with cognitive machine learning, and of course with AI. 
We also um, have been working with an ISV advisory council to really talk to them about what they need from us in order to be successful in selling business applications as well. And so if any of you are interested in joining our ISV advisory council, please let us know, either myself or Gina, and we'll make sure that you get invited to some of our calls where you have a chance to tell us what you need. Additionally, as Steve had mentioned, we've done a lot of work in the IBMI team of integrating open source options onto our platform. We have followed the industry standard and we now have an RPM site as standard for open source. We have over 300 optimized packages out there for IBMI. We continue to add new ones. The most recent ones, of course, were added in 7.4 and 7.4 Technology Refresh 1 in October. These are things like OpenMQ, um, like R, the language used for analytics and, and statistical analysis. We've added so many new functionality that all, and all at an industry standard that it has opened the door for a lot of additional business applications to move onto the IBM I environment and still retain your data where it's secure in db 2 for i And lastly, our integrated promise. We continue to do all these enhancements and we integrate them together. So when you as an ISV are putting an application onto your client's machine, you know exactly what to expect. You know that you have a copy, a full implementation of WebSphere Application Server with the Liberty profile included. You have an integrated app server that does web services serving. We have a lot of integrated components that you know what to expect. So it's the same from client to client, from machine size to machine size. There we go. Release roadmap. Just as Petra said, we get asked a lot of times about our latest releases. Well, those of you who have been staying current with IBM I know we just introduced our latest release. We introduced on April the 23rd, IBM I 7.4. We had enhancements across the board um, in database, in application development, open source, in virtualization, in cloud, supporting of new hardware. And probably the highlight of our 7.4 announcement was something called DB2 Mirror, which allows the capability of synchronously mirroring two copies of your database. Some clients are interested in this for doing things like active, active backup environments. Um, others are using it as a, using an active, active database, but doing different applications in two different nodes, knowing that you have the most current version of the, of the database replicated in both places. So lots of big, big interest in uh, DB2 Mirror. For some of you who write business applications, this is a chance for you to have a look at the application. Let us know if you need information about DB2 Mirror because it does affect the way the business application is architected. And so we can definitely give you some guidance with that as you're looking at updating um, your own code. Um, of course, we have our next release that we're working on. We're already heads down working on it and the one to follow. We're already starting to consider what will be in that release. If you look historically, it's approximately a three-year time frame between releases. That's not a guarantee. It's an approximation. So even on my chart, you can see there were only two years between 7.2 and 7.3. But internally, we work on a goal of somewhere around three years between releases, just to give you some guidance. But the most exciting thing is 7.4 is brand new, and we're Clients are, have had um, incredible uptake on that. Just as Petra mentioned, we do have a support roadmap. You'll notice I said it's updated. In September, we announced the intent to withdraw IBM I 7.2. We're going to withdraw it from marketing in April of next year and withdraw it from support April the year following. So I wanted you all to be aware of that. Um, many of you probably are. I know many ISVs really like the um, regular um, rhythm that we have in how we announce um, releases and the fact that we try to keep only two under support at any time. Um, I think many of you follow the same cadence when you're looking at updating. 
So um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Petra. I just mentioned before I do that, that both Petra and I have um, strategy white papers that were recently published. You can go out and download those from our web pages. Um, and it really does describe in more detail the strategy that we summarized onto one page, but it will give you a lot of good information um, about where we're headed and it includes multiple places, mobile computing, how the database integrates and so on. So lots of good information in those pages. All right, thanks Alison. So yeah, there are hyperlinks behind the, the graphics on that slide and from there you, you can download both, both of the pa uh, papers. And as mentioned, I mean, they contain all what we talked about here, our strategic themes, our roadmaps, but as well what we are moving towards now, um, the modernization piece. So let's talk about modernization and it's very similar for AX and IBM I and that's why we're doing this, this section uh, jointly here. Um, I think that, and, and I really think that's something that changed. We always put out new features and functions, uh, and I think IBM I started that journey a little bit earlier, but what really changed is that we put quite some effort in modernizing um, AX and IBM I environments. Uh, so that's a space where we are heavily investing in. Uh, one is for sure cloud, open source, AI, and then application modernization. And we'll touch on each of those in a little bit more detail. And we think that there's really an opportunity for you as, as an ISV as well to build atop these. So a couple more details on that slide. And of course, we have a lot of on-prem cloud capabilities uh, on our power systems, right? Due to the rock solid virtualization capabilities with Power VM smooth migration from all the generations up to power nine, uh, continuous enhancements like um, accelerated and secure LPM between power nine systems, and then power VC really, uh, which has become the phase two to manage uh, cloud environments on power systems, providing capabilities uh, to operate in hybrid environments, uh, sharing VMs um, off and off uh, on-prem, so to speak. And of course, we have um, more cloud capabilities and new enhanced offerings throughout the stack, as well as more flexible licensing models, such as monthly subscription packages, capacity on demand, or, or enterprise pools um, 2.0. And then, of course, we have more and more public cloud options, um, as well as integration scenarios with cloud native apps running in, 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 in containers, but Steve already slightly touched on. And on open source. Allison touched on that, and this is true both for AX and I, IBM I. We continuously enhancing our uh, open source capabilities on the AX toolbox and in terms of IBM I environments. Um, on the AX side, we uh, further improved our comp compatibility with other download sites, and I guess I touched on the cloud automation tools such as Ansible, Chef, and Puppet, where we heavily contribute as well. Um, in terms of AI, we have the capability, as mentioned, to, to connect to the Watson Data Platform for a while, but we listened to our clients and started to do more in terms of AI capabilities on-prem. And last but not least, and Alison will go into the details on that one, what are we doing in terms of application modernization, um, a more modern application structure, new development paradigms, uh, how are we doing solution enablement, and she will uh, sh share client stories on that. So let's look a little bit deeper into the cloud aspect. Um, and well, we have AX and IBM in the IBM cloud, we have AX in the Google cloud, we in the SkyTap cloud. And just two weeks ago, I was at the Vegas Tech U and stepped around the exhibition area and there are more and more partners providing AX and IBM in the public cloud. So there are countless solutions of these ones. And then the integration um, on, on prem or, uh, and in terms of the, the cloud native, native apps. So let's look at these two options in a little bit more detail. And on this slide, we can see some more details in terms of providing AX uh, and IBM I in the cloud. Um, it's very flexible, so you can configure a VM in our IBM cloud, how many cores, how many memory uh, you want. And from my perspective, this is really a game changer for power systems, as clients now can extend mission critical workloads to the public cloud for instance, to do dev tests, for pick up resource scenarios, or short-term projects and things like that. 
And we are working on extending that ecosystem continuously with additional power system software, IBM software, but as well with ISVs. Right? So this is an opportunity to extend this ecosystem in the IBM Cloud with uh, your ISV applications. So Steve touched, about, uh, touched on Red Hat OpenShift and the five cloud packs. Uh, I wanted just to provide a couple more details here. So the most important cloud pack for us being on the X and IBMI side of things is the cloud pack for multi-cloud management as that one allows for integration with data and workloads running on AX and IBM I and thus inside VMs. So due to this integration, you can add any AX or IBM I VM-based application to the Red Hat OpenShift catalog and thus integrate new services with existing mission-critical workloads, achieving a single catalog and coordinated orchestration, which is kind of really a nice story. And of course, we have the five IBM cloud packs, but imagine coming up with an ISV cloud pack that could be deployed on Red Hat, on top of Red Hat OpenShift and integrated via uh, the multi-cloud pack, uh, the, the cloud pack for multi-cloud management with your AX and IBM I environments as well. And I think this brings us to the next polling question. So pausing here for a second. All right, let me move on then. So. The other area I wanted to cover is um, the AI one. And I think this is really a key one and a lot of things going on here. So on this chart, I basically listed a lot of things uh, we already done and that we are investigating. And some partners already are doing a good and great job surrounding AX and IBM I with AI capabilities. That's why it's a great example. Steve touched on that, which can be deployed side by side and integrated with traditional staff and that way enable machine learning scenarios within your traditional environment and expand it to there. We made available various Python based machine learning packages both for AX and IBM I like TensorFlow, Jupyter Notebooks, books, books and, and, and continue broadening um, the, the packages we make available there. The next one I'm actually the most excited about, uh, and that is providing inferencing capabilities on enterprise systems. And that, of course, is related as well to, well, what about porting AI frameworks uh, to our enterprise systems, which means Power VM based and being CPU only. And last but not least, and that's the most further out, I would say is that we approached uh, with, with question like, what about GPUs or accelerators on our enterprise systems. So let me touch on the inf inf uh, inferencing capabilities on enterprise systems a little bit more, and, and, and Steve slightly touched on that. So uh, in theory, this slide was uh, animated, so I apologize. It's, it's a little bit packed, but what this slide talks about and what we really see is that clients would like to get started from where they are. And many clients prefer to pilot artificial intelligence projects from yeah, where they are at a smaller scale, leveraging their on-prem systems uh, and capacity they already have in place. For instance, spinning up a VM on your 980 system in order to try it out and play around with AI a bit. And in many cases, it is helpful to be close to the data when you want to perform AI when doing infer inferencing. That could be for security reasons, uh, because um, of course you need a good training set. Um, but so far you had to move all that data to a Linux training system and then leverage AI for that data. So um, let's assume there's one highly secure system running PowerVM, um, highly available and secure. You couldn't leverage um, that data for AI capabilities so far, but now bringing AI capabilities to these environments, you could do so. In addition, it's very interesting in terms of faster data movement and lower latency because you can leverage high-speed um, interconnects uh, to process very high volume of, of data for, for AI inferencing with, with minimal network delays. And that, of course, leads to, well, it's interesting in terms of integration purposes and combined AI and application workload efficiency, managing both AI inferencing and existing applications like database workloads um, on one power system.
fraud detection is a very interesting use case. So what about if you could leverage AI integrated with the DB2 uh, transaction um, sales system? And we made basically two things available. We ported some of the uh, Watson Machine Learning Community Edition frameworks to run on a Power BI-based system like TensorFlow, Flask, and others. So you could basically deploy an AI model on a Linux and Power VM VM and then leverage REST APIs to move data between your Linux VM and your AX VM. And the other thing, and Steve touched on that, is the use case with HDO driverless AI. Because we work together with them to extend their solution that you can take the model that was deployed with HDO driverless AI, for instance, on an AC922 and deploy it natively on AX and IBMI as well, which is very interesting because now you can use traditional JDBC connection to get the data in and out your DB2 databases to do your AI inferencing and get uh, near real-time insights um, in, 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 in use cases like fraud detection and others. And as this is such an interesting use case, we even came up with a bundle, which you can see in, in small on the right-hand side, bundling um, an AC922 starter configuration with the h driverless AI software, as well as complementary onboarding in case you would like uh, to, to pursue that path. So that's a good example for a partner with whom we closely collaborated with. Uh, in, in that space. And of course, there are various scenarios and uh, where you could basically integrate these AI capabilities within your ISV application for fraud detection scenarios, classification scenarios, and, and others. And I mean, Gina will have a poll in the end what you would like to see in upcoming webcasts. I mean, this can only provide so much information in, in 90 minutes at a, at a relatively high level, but all of us are happy to come back to talk on the one or other topic in more detail in one of the upcoming webcasts. So with that, let me pass the ball back to Allison to talk about application modernization. Thank you. So application modernization, I feel um, <laughs> I'm talking to experts in this. Um, many ISVs, as we know, have been updating your applications for many years. I always joke and say that when you modernize your application, that actually is a descriptive term of everything you do from the first time you put it into production. So I know many of you have been um, modernizing for many years. And what I thought I would do is run through a couple of key things that we've been talking about and also talk a little bit about a couple of client examples. So let's start and talk a little bit about modernizing applications and looking at the modern application structure. Um, modern application structure is very interesting um, because it's really a, quite a different structure than what it was when we started with the AS400 or with the original versions of AIX many years ago. Um, modern application structure today is highly modular, highly agile, takes advantage of new user interfaces, integrates function from the database, as well as from cloud. And cloud I'm going to use in a broad sense at this chart, but we'll talk a little bit more about it. So modern structure supports all the modern paradigms that we learned from the original object-oriented design, which was small pieces of code, integrated together or built together. I call it application assembly. But as I said, you, you folks on the call have been doing this for, for, for a while, so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, we also, in our modern applications, we also have these new development paradigms. And many of us are working with new user experience. And I use the term experience, not interface. We've been talking in, um, our marketplace for a long time about putting in graphical interfaces, but we're also now at the stage where we can integrate new user experience through mobile um, devices, through card readers, internet of things, different places where we can gather data that we can use in our application. It's not just from end users keying things in. As well, we have all of the new things that we do in a development paradigm. In fact, IBM implements many of these in our development teams, both AIX and IBM I. We do agile development. They have 
um, daily or weekly scrums where the teams talk about what they're going through, what they're working on. And certainly framework development with many languages has helped us in developing and creating um, applications quicker. Of course, on top of all of that, we have to be using modern development tools. From an IBMI perspective, I absolutely know about 30% of our clients are still using the older tools for development. As ISVs, I'm hoping that you take advantage of some of the programs we have in place like our dev demo program where you have an opportunity to get hardware as well as development software at a lower cost and that you're using those new, um, the new tools that sit on a desktop. These are the things that will allow you to implement a lot of the other capabilities that um, Petra and Steve have touched on and that we're going to talk about a little bit more now. So, I built this chart because, um, and by the way, if I've missed you as one of my many traditional solution vendors, I apologize. We have about um, well over 4,500 different vendors and 4,500 icons don't fit on my little tiny box. So I just picked a few applications. These are the business application vendors. In our environment today, they're usually written in RPG, COBOL, Java, C, C++, um, perhaps in Fortran, other things that run um, on both platforms. Um, depending on the platform, they use IBM DB2, but they also might use Oracle if you're running on AIX. And of course, running on the operating system and running on top of the latest in power systems. Now, these traditional solutions continue to run. They will continue to run um, as long as we have all those compilers and languages on the box, which will probably be forever. And many of you may identify with those applications. Where we've been really pushing lately is in modernizing of those environments. Things like, as I said, new ways of gathering data. And this is one of the companies that we worked with. They use mobile devices and they integrate geo-positioning codes to know where their delivery trucks are for delivering wine and beer through South Carolina. So different ways of gathering information. Um, Bista in the Netherlands, Bista A2 is the company that provides the software for Volvo dealerships. And they've done a lot of work with a couple of different vendors, Profound Logic as well as ORCAD, but they've implemented an agile process for development. And they go and talk to all of their end user clients. They use a variety of different tools. So if you haven't moved to a, I would say a DevOps kind of environment, looking at their story of how they implemented DevOps in their development shop would be really helpful. Um, extending applications, if, if you have functionality, things like interacting with um, Internet of Things devices, if you have functionality that you can't do today using traditional languages, you could be using a lot of open source languages that run on both AIX and many of them on I as well. Of course, on I, they run in the PACE environment, which is a subset of the AIX kernel. So most of the open source languages today, industry standard, will run on both AIX and IBM I and allow you to implement functionality you hadn't considered for your application before. For example, Yori, a high-end furniture manufacturer, they have used open source to extend their business application and allow clients to look at a configuration of the chairs that they're ordering and allow them to look 360 degrees. It's all written in open source and the client has an opportunity when they enter in their order to then request that look and feel, if you will, the 360 degree view. This is highly effective when we're dealing with end clients and online retailing to be able to look at this kind of implementation. And again, all written with industry standard open source. In this case, it runs right on IBM I. Another good example or an, a use case for those of you who have applications that you maintain and manage that have um, shop floor, manufacturing assembly lines. Kawasaki in Japan is actually having their inventory management system interface with Internet of Things um, with way scales at each of the stations along an assembly line. 
And when the goods on that weigh scale drop to a certain weight, they know that they have to order just-in-time inventory to be able to have delivery to their plant. It's prevented them from having to stockpile goods either beside the station or in their warehouse. Instead, they can monitor the weight of the product, uh, weight of the box of widgets, and they know when to order. So they've cut down on um, a lot of their overhead in stockpiling parts. So if you have an application, if you write an application like this, manufacturing warehouse control, something like this, extending to the Internet of Things would be extremely helpful um, for your clients. So another way we might look at modernizing, and Petra touched on this a bit, is Linux also runs on, on the same power box. Um, you could have, if you're an IBM iShop, perhaps you spin up an AIX partition, but a Linux partition as well. In AIX, you could also run IBM i or Linux side by side. You all know the beauty of the Power Platform is that all three of them run on the same server, the same box. So it's really good to be able to use some of that functionality. So some of the things around Python um, that were created by the Open Source Foundation, NumPy, for example, a neural network version of um, Python or written in Python, or uh, TensorFlow. We have a couple of clients that are using TensorFlow applications for visual recognition, and the runtime of that runs on Linux. Um, and, and we have a number of different um, implementations that can run side by side with your traditional AIX and IBM I applications to allow you to do functionality and get features that you couldn't otherwise. And you can still let your data reside in DB2 or Oracle where, um, where it's considered safe. Let it reside there and have access from these Linux applications from many of the open source environments. Or you can distribute your data and also put it in a Linux partition in one of the open source databases like Mongo or Maria, one of those. Oris in Belgium is a good example of that. Oris needed to have scheduling software. They are like a high-end Airbnb, and Oris wanted to have the ability to do scheduling, um, and the scheduling software that they found ran only in Linux. But the partner that was involved liked the scheduling software and recommended they leave their data in IBM I. So if you're an ISV that's coding for another platform and you want to leave data in another partition, um, it's definitely possible, as Oris has proved, proven, they have their scheduling software running in a Linux partition um, provided by an ISV, and they leave their data on IBM I where clients can use a web interface to get to information about the properties or to enter in their own account information. So again, combination of platforms is often the best implementation to satisfy clients. Um, Petra touched on the cloud. I just want to talk about it a little bit um, from an application perspective. In both IBM I and AIX, we have the ability to generate and consume REST APIs. So using REST APIs, really the world's your oyster. You have an opportunity to go out and use um, functionality that's available elsewhere on the internet. We have a company, um, an ISV actually in the UK, that is building a, a user-friendly front end on the UK tax um, information for retailers. And they have used a number of REST APIs that go out to the government and run different functionality in the government machines, and they bring it back to their application where it's made more user-friendly. If anybody's dealt with government taxes, you know how unfriendly they generally are. So this is a great service to retailers in the UK. But just an example of using REST APIs. Now, many of you have been using cloud components or running part or all of your application in the cloud already to do things like credit checking, to do tax calculations, other things. It's just made easier by the fact that we can consume and generate REST APIs easily.
As well, many of you know, in uh, a couple of years ago in the IBMI space, we spent a lot of time working with Watson and understanding how applications can talk to or call the Watson APIs and services. That's expanded um, under uh, Petra has worked really hard with the AIX team to do an expansion of that work right into the AIX team as well. So really cool implementations of using um, Watson capabilities in the IBM cloud space. And just a couple of examples, Roberte in France uses Watson to do answering of operations messages. So they have trained Watson to answer questions about printing and messages and so on, requiring fewer support staff. Now that's an operations kind of thing, but you could be building that into an application as well, just as Roberte did. And finally, both Steve and Petra quickly talked about Power AI running on an AC922. We have a lot of clients today that are running um, applications on an AC922 building um, a model. That model can then be deployed natively to IBM I, to AIX, or in some cases, depending on the product, it stays on the AC922. But it processes data that's collected on IBM I or AIX. Now, this is a wonderful kind of invention that we have, or sorry, integration that we have um, as, we're, as we're able to take our data or allow access to data to do in-depth analysis. Some of the products like TensorFlow do visual recognition in helping with fraud detection and helping with identification and so on. So lots of good opportunities for integrating um, Power AI and those kinds of capabilities into business applications. Steve mentioned Vision Banco. This is a bank in Paraguay who's had incredible success in integration of H2O with IBM I data. As he said, they've seen two times the client propensity to buy or purchase investment opportunities, and they've done that by doing deep analysis of the data itself, and then they generate email and opportunity out to clients. Um, if you're 20 years old, you get a different set of investment options than if you're 60 years old. And that only makes sense, but they've been able to um, really focus their investment opportunity and they're seeing incredible payback for that, an over 50% growth in investment. So that's an incredible story and just an opportunity of how we integrate these things. So with that, I'm going to turn it back. Thank you for taking the poll and answering. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Gina and let Gina um, talk a little bit more about the resources and what's next. Thanks, Allison. All right. So we're, we're at the tail end here. We do have a couple of questions. So we'll, we'll talk through the, the resources and next steps here somewhat quickly so we can get to the questions. Just as a reminder, if you do have a question, as I said, we've had a few come in, but feel free to enter those into the, the Q&A. And if we're not able to get to that, all of them, then we can certainly follow up. Um, so we, we've talked about a lot of really good information about cloud, um, you know, the investments we're making there, um, AI, um, the updates that we've made and, and strategic direction for AIX and IBMI. And so now you may be asking yourself, you know, what are the next steps here? How do I take advantage of, of some of this technology? You know, how do we work together to make, to, to leverage you know, the power systems platforms uh, to bring mutual client value? Um, so a, a few areas that I want to talk about, first of all, is a you know, very simple one. How do you get access to power systems hardware? And I'll talk more about this in, in just a moment here, but you can access that hardware through the Client Experience Center Cloud. So we'll, we'll go through some details there. As well as application modernization, we talked a lot about that, right? Um, so we have a co-creation lab, and I'll, I'll provide some more details here in just a moment, where we have free, <clears throat> excuse me, free resources, free workshops um, that are available to ISVs to, um, you know, to learn more about how to modernize um, and, and that can involve a number of different aspects, um, including a complementary AI assessment. Uh, we also have market development funds available for, for co-marketing activities. Um, that could include you know, everything from professional branded collateral, joint white papers, uh, 
customer success story, stories, and you saw a number of those that, that Allison and, and Petra talked about, um, and Steve as well. Uh, it could involve sponsorships at industry conferences, digital marketing campaigns, so a number of different things that are available through, that mar through those market development funds and to support go-to-market activities. Uh, as part of that go-to-market, there are sales enablement sessions that we highlight ISVs um, in on a regular basis uh, for our channel. Um, talks and demos that are available to clients as well, um, including webcasts <laughs> that would highlight your, your ISV, your, your application running on power. Um, and there are obviously opportunities for us to co-sell, right, where we, we work with clients jointly on that customer value and to solve some of the problems that they're having, whether it's related to cloud or AI or, you know, just simple things running their day-to-day -day business. So let me tell about, talk about the Client Experience Center a little bit. Um, this call, by the way, um, you should have a recording, or not a recording, I'm sorry, a final email reminder that went out about the webcast, which will take you to the recording. So you'll have access to some of the URLs and our contact information that, we, that we've shared in this webcast. So to get started in the Client Experience Center, again, this is access to an environment um, virtual resources available for you to do, you know, testing, to, to work on modernization, any number of things, um, to, to do functional tests. Um, so any, anything that you need to do on the power systems um, uh, to be able to leverage the, the platform will be available to you. And that is provided with access, support, um, to make sure that you have a, a smooth experience there. Okay, I also mentioned the co-creation lab, um, and these are free one-on-one -on -one workshops for our ISV community. So as I mentioned before, you know, we can work with you on modernizing your application. We have a number of ISVs that have worked with us um, to, to help modernize um, or, or take advantage of modernization opportunities. Um, there's a, a gold mine of data out there, right, for our mutual clients, and so they may want to leverage it for customer insights. Um, you know, you may be interested in understanding how we can best work together in order to be able to deliver that to a client. Um, this can also be used for uh, proof of concepts with clients, you know, where we're, we're progressing a deal or, you know, working to win that deal for our organization. So that is available, whether it's cloud or AI um, or whatever key initiative you have within your organization, okay? Um, this last poll really is, um, and we'll go to that, Mike, if you, can, if you can make that available to the attendees. We are very happy to do one-on-one -on -one discussions. We covered a lot of material, I know, through, <laughs> through this webcast, uh, and you may have follow-up questions. Uh, we would love to extend the offer to do a one-on-one -on -one discuss discussion where we can deep dive on, on initiatives that are key to your organization and where we can help you on your, your journey with power systems. Um, in addition to that, there's also a polling question. As, as I mentioned when we, we kicked off, we will be doing regular webcasts. We'll have outgoing communication to you. Um, newsletters and, and uh, among other things, we want to make sure that we're covering topics that are, you know, of most interest to you, our ISV community. Gina, maybe while we give uh, folks more time to answer the poll, do you want to just start answering some of the questions that we? Yes, absolutely, about? Petra. Yeah, good idea. Um, especially since we're we're just about to wrap up here. So a couple of questions that came in. Um, one is specific is specific from um, an ISV that's in the discrete manufacturing area. Um, they are curious about being able to leverage our vision product to, to do quality con or to extend quality control to their clients. So that was one question that came in. Steve, I know you talked about that in your section. Yeah, so um, so clearly the uh, opportunity uh, to to leverage vision type of technologies 
uh, to extend capabilities is is growing and and going to be key for for people in the future, right? I, I encourage you to reach out to uh, Gina, right, uh, and the team here, and we can certainly get you in touch with um, what we're doing around um, uh, vision and quality manufacturing. Very innovative solution using AI vision. Uh, connecting out into iOS devices, as an example, right? But then you can, uh, you know, look at how you could build in uh, either through APIs or other things uh, that set of information on, you know, quality control and those type of things into your applications as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, another question had come in about the IBM public cloud. Um, many of our clients have a need for this. Uh, how do we go about getting our application into the IBM public cloud? So Gina, this is Petra, and I just uh, scrolled through the other question. I think there's a common theme to, to a lot of questions that were coming in, like what are the next steps? Uh, whom do I reach out to in case uh, I would like to have a discussion and work towards it? So I think first point of contact might be you or the team here, right? And we will be able to, to, to get you connected with the right teams because, of course, it's a different team uh, in terms of the IBM public cloud. It's a different team when, when talking about AI. Uh, but Gina being responsible for all that and all of us helping to drive this, right? I from the X side, um, Allison from the IBM side, and, and Steve overall, uh, you can reach out to, to all of us directly and, and we'll help you get the next steps in place. Thanks, Petra. Uh, and this is Allison. I would just add to that. There are a couple of questions about pricing for cloud. There's so many different cloud options. It's best we'll reach out to, um, or you can reach back to the team here, and we can help you work through what you're looking for in terms of pricing. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I know many of you have answered the polling question about one-on-one -on -one discussion, so that's certainly one way we'll follow up with you and can learn more about you know, specific areas of interest. Um, again, the, the contact information um, and the recording for this webcast is, it will be available through the, the most recent email that you received from us. And um, just to close, I, I will give you my email address as well. It's glking at us.ibm.com. Um, happy to field any of these questions for you and we can dive further into, into next steps. So, Thank you again for joining us today. Um, hope this was valuable. We look forward to your feedback and our um, ongoing communication. Thank you very much. And we will talk to you in January. Be sure to register for that next web webcast. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Bye.